Thank you, Jan. I'm so pleased to welcome you all here this evening and so glad to see so many faces in the audience. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you to Akram Zatari's lecture entitled Address, Folded, Open, Performed, and Buried Letters as a Form of Art. I would first like to uh, do the first introduction of our ASL and sign language interpreter this evening, Kelly Bolin, right beside me. Uh, Kelly will be working this evening to interpret uh, this event, and we are grateful for her assistance in making this event accessible to the deaf community. This evening, Akram will guide us through various samples of his work, borrowing the letter format to engage and contribute in writing a complex and disputed history. The lecture will be followed by a screening of his latest work, Letter to a Refusing Pilot, uh, which was produced for the Lebanon Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2013. After this screening, we'll welcome questions and comments from the audience, uh, and I invite you to use the microphones that are located in either aisle of the auditorium for your questions. At the end of the event, I also invite you all to join us uh, for a reception in honor of Akram Zatari, and the reception will be held just down the street at the Agnes Etherington Art Center. Uh, this is also a perfect opportunity to view the exhibition currently on view, Akram Zatari, all is well. A great deal of work was done in support of Akram's visit to Kingston, uh, which predates my time here at the Agnes Etherington Arts Centre. As such, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of my predecessor, Sylvie Fortin, uh, who did so much to make this lecture and Akram's trip to Kingston possible. I'd like to express my sincere thanks for Sylvie's efforts to secure the funding for, from Queen's University and the Canada Council for the Arts. I would also like to thank several staff members at the Agnes who have been invaluable to this event, including our public programs manager, Pat Sullivan, and our administrative coordinator, Chantal Rousseau. A special note of thanks also goes out to Chantal Christine Valkenborg, who assisted with the setup this evening, as well as our communications intern, Emily Marshall, who helped with the promotion of this event. In our funding applications, we also drew on the support of a number of individuals and departments within the university. And for their support, I'd like to thank Susan Lord, the head of the Film and Media Department, Adnan Hussein, the director of the Muslim Society's Global Perspectives Initiative in the Department of History, and uh, Dorit Naiman of the Film and Media Department, who supported our application as acting director of the Cultural Studies Program. I'd also like to extend my thanks to Matt Rogalski uh, at the School of Music at Queen's University and the instructor of the interdisciplinary second year course IDS, IDIS, sorry, 210 Arts and Society. I'd like to thank him for graciously allowing us to take over his class this evening. Now finally, uh, to introduce our distinguished guest, Akram Zatari. Um, Akram Zatari was born in Saida, Lebanon, and he is an artist, curator, and writer living in Beirut. He is one of the co-founders of the Arab Image Foundation, a non-profit organization whose mission is to collect, preserve, and study photographs of the Middle East, North Africa, and Arab diaspora. Akram's work has been featured in discourse-setting exhibitions such as Documenta 13, and was recently on view at the Museum of Modern Art in New York earlier this year, as well as being on view at the Venice Biennial, um, where he represented Lebanon in 2013. Uh, and we're so pleased uh, to be uh, welcoming Akram here tonight and very uh, excited to hear his lecture. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Akram to present the lecture, Addressed, Folded, Open, Performed, and Buried Letters as a Form of Art. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Sylvie, for uh, making this trip possible. A few years ago, I was um, becoming aware of the importance of uh, letters in my work. That was not a conscious um, um, gesture when I started making work, especially in 1997, when I encountered for the first time um, texts, letter texts. And I was interested in them as a way of talking about distance. One writes letters because one wants to send a message far. Um, 
And that's the basic form of, um, of a letter. In 1996, I started uh, research about the occupied southern Lebanon. Um, it's, it's an area of um, almost 12% 12, uh, 12 of Lebanon that was occupied from 1978 until 2000. And a few years before the Israelis decided to withdraw from South Lebanon, I started this research and I decided to do my research among um, former prisoners in Israel. So I interviewed a lot of um, prisoners and um, families of prisoners who were still um, in captivity in Israel, and among them the Hawada uh, family. Nabi Hawada is a um, he was, he was quite young when I met his family. He is six years younger than me. He got his first uh, military training with um, a section, a military section in the Communist Party, the Lebanese Communist Party, at the age of 14. And he excelled quite, um, quite well. And he started engaging in military operations. So he would be sent from Beirut across the sealed border, still a sealed border to the, to the occupied um, zone. To, uh, with others, with other members of the Lebanese resistance, to execute military operations. And he was caught uh, with, the, his, with his group right before they execute one of the military operations, and they were taken to Israel. Nabi was um, below the official age where he could be taken to, to court in Israel. So they had to place him in a temporary uh, prison because he was 16 until the day he turned 18. It's only then that he was sent to court and then sentenced an amount of um, years uh, imprisonment. I was uh, very interested in him, particularly not only because he was young, but because he wrote two uh, beautiful letters to his family. <clears throat> letters used to be sent through the Red Cross, and the Red Cross still has um, typical forms um, for prisoners to uh, use and then hand it to prison authority, the prison authority hands them to, uh, uh, to the Red Cross and the Red Cross delivers them to, uh, from Israel to Lebanon and from Lebanon to, uh, to Israel. Um, and after doing this research, I made this film called All is Well on the Border. And All is Well on the Border takes uh, its title from this very positive um, um, uh, attitude that Nabi um, took in his letters. So he, he would he would try to al always be positive, trying to tell his family that he's doing okay and that all is well in prison, even when things did not go well. And um, I decided to call the film All is Well on the Border and I decided to give this same title to, to the exhibition. Uh, not only because many of Nabihi's documents and letters are on display in the exhibition, but because I think facing uh, despair, one, one, one can only, uh, one's means of survival can only be um, this positive attitude facing things. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show you a few excerpts from All is One on the Border, just to show you also how, in what sensitivity I was reading uh, Nabi's letters, because from 1997, when I used them the first time, until, until 2007, 10 years later, when I used them the second time, there's a big uh, difference. الساعة الثانية عشر وربع من منتصف ليلة رأس السنة. بعد ربع ساعة من انقضاء سنة 92 وبداية سنة 93 امسكت بالقلم لأقول لكم كل عام وأنتم بخير متمنيا أن يكون عام السعادة والتوفيق وعام العودة واللقاء بكم للمرة الخامسة تتوادع السنين تقبل بعضها البعض وقلبي المشتاق يحمل الأمنية ويعيدكم عبر الأوراق حاولنا أن نحتفل أن نعود بالسنين الخمسة إلى الوراء لنجلس معكم حول مائدة الفرحة ولنرقص على إيقاع المحبة حاولنا جاهدين أن ننزع الجسد من ركام القيود فننشد معكم أغنية الليل وسهراته الجميلة حاولنا فعل ذلك ففرحنا كثيرا أعدنا السنين والذاكرة والحاضر أعدناهم جميعا إلى حضن الوطن 
قضيت سهرة العيد على أنغام الإذاعة وما أن أعلن عن انتهاء عام حتى أمسكت سيجارة الدخان ودخنتها لا عينا السنة الماضية ولا عينا أيضا السنة القادمة إذا كانت ستكون مثل السابقة وقد كتبت هذه العبارة على السيجارة على فكرة أصبح تقليد عندي أن أدخن سيجارة واحدة الساعة الثانية عشر ليلا بليلة رأس السنة لأنها ليلة مميزة أو أحاول أن أجعلها مميزة مرة أخرى أتمنى لكم عاما سعيدا وأن رسالة هذه وسيلة لأعبر لكم عن أنكم بخاطري في مختلف المناسبات مع كل الحب لك أمي الحنونة وقبلاتي للجميع فردا فردا وتبقى أمنيتي لكم بالفرحة الدائمة والاجتماع سويا ابنكم المشتاق نيرودا So these um, um, letters were given to uh, someone who read them as voiceover on um, uh, applied on um, documents from the occupied um, South Lebanon. In this case, these were like military operations that that used to be sent by uh, the Lebanese resistance to uh, the media right after they executed military operations. So they had with them someone who would be filming just to present an evidence or a proof that such a military operation actually happened. When Israel, even when Israel used to deny them. So um, I, was, I was using them, using them as texts, not as objects. And that's in 10 years. Uh, started changing. I'm going to show you another example of another letter. By the way, he used to sign Neruda because that was his party nickname. Um, he said that one time uh, someone told him, oh, you, you are good at writing poetry. We should call you simply Neruda. And he didn't know who uh, Neruda was. أمي الحبيبة أجمل اللحظات هي التي أعيشها الآن وأطيب الأوقات أقضيها مع استماعي لصوتك فلقد كان اليوم مميز عشت كل معاني الكلمات فرحت كثيرا بذلك فرحت لأني اطمأنيت عنك فصوت العتابة يتردد في أذني آه يا أمي كم كانت هذه الأمنية غالية على قلبي وحياتي سعادتي الآن لا توصف فمنذ فترة طويلة ولم أستمع لصوتك الحنون أشكرك من كل قلبي أمي الغالية ماذا أخبرك؟ صدقا إن الصحة جيدة ولا يوجد ما يستحق أن تشغل بالك فالسجن لن يستطيع أن يتمكن مني مهما طالت أيامه وسنواته الساعة الآن الواحدة بتوقيت بيروت الثانية عشر بتوقيت هنا الساعة السابعة والنصف استمعت إليك فهذه المرة استطعت أن أستمع إلى كل كلمة قلتيها كانت الإذاعة واضحة جدا وهذه المرة الأولى التي تكون بهذا الوضوح حتى لما قلت آخ يا نبيه سمعتها اليوم التاريخ 16 تسعة فقبل ست أيام دخلت في السنة السادسة وكان اللقاء معك اليوم بمثابة انطلاقة جديدة. So in while using the letters as texts, I was interested in creating two parallel paths, almost collated one onto another. On one hand, a document from South Lebanon, visual document, and on other hand, a text coming from prison. And I thought that putting them together, presenting them, overlapping them in such a way would kind of bridge the distance between here and there. <clears throat> Ten years passed and uh, the letters and their, the, the way they looked, the way um, they, they were drawn on, um, did, in a way did not leave me. And in 2007, I decided to go back and look for Nabi and look for the letters. 
and try to make a visual work that addresses the letters for what they are visually and not for the text that they carry. So it's not data that I'm interested in anymore. I'm interested in other kind of data that are, that, that is latent in how the letter looked, how it was uh, kept, preserved. How, for example, one of the things that uh, struck me a lot, I mean, we're talking about almost six years. He, he was in prison for 10 years, but he wrote letters from the third year and on, and not before. And I could see, for example, his handwriting changing so much from year three to, to year 10. I could see him starting drawing on, um, on the letter forms. Like this is one of the, I mean, they're not uh, very complex drawings. They look often like, um, like stencils, like ready, ready made uh, flowers. But still, it was so beautiful to see this coming out of a, of a, of a prison. This is another um, sample of, of these letters. And uh, this is how he brought them to me. The first time I asked him for the letters, he went to his mother uh, and he looked for them. She had kept them in an old um, woman's bag. So, um, so, so he gave me uh, this bag with the letters. And he had with him something else that I didn't uh, have access before, which was this beautiful, well-binded book, very artisanal, in, in, like bound in a very artisanal way. This is the book in which he kept all the letters that he received from his family. So in 1997, I had access only to one part of, of that communication, of that uh, uh, correspondence. And when I met him, he gave me this other part. And he had uh, made them in such a way to uh, where he could add like letters to into the book. So it's not really officially bound, but um, it's like a book that you can that you can add to as 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 you go. And he decorated it with different things that he got from magazines, including an advertising of whiskey, because one of the main things like. In prison, you had people from Amal movement, from Hezbollah, from the Communist Party, and from other type of um, political affiliations. And he just was so proud that he come, he's coming from a communist background and not from like a, 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 um, So in other terms, he was really liberal in his, in his ideas. That's Nabi, to, um, a year before he was uh, uh, Caught while doing his military operation. His, this is a picture that was taken at home with um, one of the guns that were available for training. And this is another, I'm going to show you another uh, document. What I'm doing is like I'm, I'm now trying to reconstruct for you aspects of, uh, of Nabi's character, aspects of his, uh, of like just telling you where he, where he comes from. Now, now, this is also another document that he uh, gave me as a VHS tape, and I digitized the, VH, the VHS tape, which is another form of letter. It's a recorded video letter uh, that was done in, that was produced in prison by the prison authorities and sent through the Red Cross as well to, uh, to Nabi's family. <laughs> معتقل من 10 9 1988 في جنوب لبنان. بحب وجه تحياتي لاهلي ولاقاربي ولاصدقائي ولرفاقي في لبنان وبطمنهم انه صحتي منيحه وبخير وما بعاني من اي مشكله صحيه بالعكس معنوياتي عاليه برغم كل هالسنين الصعبه اللي مرت علينا داخل السجن. بل التحيات الخاصة والمميزة لأمي الحنونة وبتمنى أنها تكون بخير وصحة وعافية وأنها تكون صامدة وصابرة أمام الظروف اللي مرت وأمام سنين الفراق الطويلة وهذا الإشي بيكون بمثابة معنويات لنا ولصمودنا ولاستمرارنا في داخل هذا السجن آه لابد انه من اليوم من الايام انه نلتقي مع بعض ونرجع ونعيش آه ايامنا الحلوه 
في الحركه كل الامان اللي طمحنا لنا لها وكانت الظروف اللي اليوم بنمر فيها او الظروف الفراق الصعبه والقاسيه اللي بنعيشها كانت هي ضريبه طبيعيه للشيء اللي بنؤمن فيه وبنحبه وبنناضل عشان انا بخير وصحه منيحه وعافيه وبطمن امي انه انا بخير كمان وبطمن اختي الغاليه والحبيبه على قلبي اختي زويا ولا بناتها مريم وفرح ولا زوجها العزيز فادي كمان بحب بلغ سلامي الخاص والحاضر جدا لخيي محمد بقول له انه انا كمان بخير ومعنويات حالي ومبسوط كثير ل انه بيشتغل وبيساعد امي وبيهتم بالبيت وفي الاسره بغيابي وكذلك العمر بوجه تحياتي ل I actually, you 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 realize while reading the letters why he has a lot of positivity, but also he doesn't say much because it's a very it's, he keeps on repeating um, the same things because uh, when you send a letter through the prison's authority, you are um, allowed to communicate issues of strictly personal uh, nature. Otherwise, your letters will be censored. So nothing serious has to be said in those letters. I think families, whether families or or, or him, used to read in between in between lines, in between um, what's being said. Um, this is Nabi in 2007 when I when he gave me the, uh, this material, and then while inter if interviewing him a lot about the old types of communication, he, he told me about photographs that used to be sent also with the, with the Red Cross. And uh, that opened like another box of really fascinating uh, iconography. That's him in prison. So every time he would tell me something, I'm really surprised and said, him, okay, so someone used to come and take pictures of you in prison? He said, yes. In 1993, uh, Apparently, there was a lot of strikes synchronized uh, between all prisons in Israel. And uh, they, the prisoners were asking for so many demands, including, for example, not sleeping on the floor, but raising the mattress to become a bed, uh, not, not wearing brown, but wearing other sorts of colors, uh, being able to um, eat different, like more than four ingredients. In the early phases, they could eat only four different items of food and they were asking for more number of variety of of food etc and they were they were granted some of their demands including receiving a photographer appointed by the prison authority to take pictures of them every six months in order to deliver these pictures to their parents especially that some of them <clears throat> were not Palestinian, in other terms, like their families could not come and visit them, like Lebanese families or Syrian families or Jordanian families could not come and visit uh, family members of theirs that are detained in Israel because simply they cannot travel to Israel. So photography was one way of uh, attaching an image with your letter, sending uh, it to your parents. and. That's really like, like for me, I didn't know that before. And he, that's also another picture of him. And he gave me 48 pictures of other prisoners too. So this started as a, as a practice, as a way to send your picture to your parents, telling them that you are doing well and that you are physically healthy. But also you started to give it to other prisoners of yours when they were leaving prison as a souvenir that you dedicate, or because prisoners corresponded between different prisons, like from Nafha to Askalan or others, um, they would correspond to, with each other even if they don't know each other. So they're like um, an activity like, um, like, the, like the old Pental tradition. Pe um, prisoners would simply correspond with each other and without knowing how they looked. So the moment they were allowed pictures in 1993, uh, they would send with their letters pictures like this one, for example, and this one. This is, a, this is a particularly interesting letter because normally they were not allowed to be photographed together in one, um, 
it's like if the photographer allows you only um, to figure alone in the picture. And here they convince the photographer to have a friend of this prisoner showing in the mirror. <clears throat> they all used, by the way, um, most of them used backdrops that are uh, bed covers. So each one would bring his bed cover and put it uh, in the back, following the old tradition of having backdrops in a photographer's uh, studio. Many of them would use the same um, shoes, for example, that they would borrow. If, if a prisoner has, a ni has nice shoes, they would all borrow it and be photographed with it. So when you send it to your parents, they realize that you are dressing, dressing well and you are uh, in good shape. So that added a lot to, uh, to my idea of um, correspondence and my idea of uh, uh, letters in and out of, of, uh, of prison. And that pushed me to work with, uh, with Nabih later, um, one year later, on a, on a different project that was more performative, but using um, the form of the letters that carry what's accepted, what's permitted to say, as opposed to other forms of letters where people are not, um, um, where, where people are more free in, um, in expressing um, their thoughts. Um, in other terms, all security related uh, matters going in and out of prison would circulate through another secret form of writing. And um, I'm, I'm going to show you, I'm going to skip this image and I'll tell you later what what this is. I'm going to show you this part of this film called Letter to Samir. And here I asked Nabi Hawada to reenact the making of a capsule that is supposedly, uh, that the function of which is to carry secret letters. And um, this used to be carried by prisoners leaving prison for a, for a, for a short period of time. Like for example, going to a clinic or going to, a, to sit in a court case. And the prison system in Israel works in such a way to have like a central portal through which all the prisoners coming from different prison would be sent. They stay there for two, three days and they are dispatched from that uh, portal into destinations. Um, so over there in that, in that crossroads, let's, let's call it, you are likely to uh, encounter prisoners going to, going in all directions. So if you have a political um, uh, message or a message related to security that is going from a prison A to prison C, you go through this portal, this crossroads, and uh, what you do is you uh, swallow the, um, uh, the capsule w the day you leave prison and you leave prison with the capsule in your stomach. And when you go in this crossroads and in, in this portal, you stay there for two, three days, you are more likely to use the toilet and you take the capsule out, clean it and look for another prisoner going to the destination of prison C, who takes it, swallows it again and leave um, that portal back to the destination. And this is how prisoners were able to synchronize, for example, strikes, hunger strikes across um, different prisons. This is how everything related to uh, spies or collaborators infiltrating prisons. This is how um, uh, opinion is sought from from like about any case because prisoner prisons had leaderships and leaderships was scattered basically in Nafha or Askalan. So any question related to security from any other prison would be addressed to them and would be sent to them. And I asked Nabi, okay, let's, I was interested physically in how to make a, such a capsule. But we looked for a, a, a situation and that situation came uh, when Samir al-Kantar, the longest lasting Lebanese prisoner in Israel, was released. Samir al-Kantar uh, did a military, a very violent military operation inside Israel. So he was not, uh, leading a military operation in the South Lebanon. He, he was able to infiltrate with two others into Israel. And uh, he killed a father and a daughter 
and he, he caused the death of um, a second daughter. At least he's accused by the Israelis of doing uh, doing so. Whether he did it or not, I'm really not here to uh, to 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 reach that. So uh, I'm going to show you. So I, I told Nabi, do you think you have anything to tell to Samir al-Kantar, things that you cannot say in public? And we decided that this is going to be like some kind of time capsule. So it's a time capsule that is delayed, the, the reading of which is delayed in time until you could express those things that you cannot express today about um, the release of Samir al-Kantar. Something else that many people reproach to Samir uh, in a very, um, not out loud, not such an out loud uh, way, is like Samir al-Kantar went, did um, his military operation with the PLF, with the Palestinian Liberation Front. He was part of that front. And when he uh, was released, um, on the day of his release, he appeared for the first time wearing the Hezbollah uh, fighting uniform, and he was kind of adopted by, by Hezbollah. So that capsule is wrapped six or seven times in, in plastic and well sealed with a lighter. Normally before it's swollen, I'm gonna skip it until the end. This is how the capsule looks. Why did I do this capsule? Parallel to the, in those 10 years between 1997 and 2007, I encountered such an amazing story um, that you see well documented in the film called In This House. Um, and I realized that I'm interested in, in, in time capsules, in letters that take the form of time capsules. In other terms, letters like this, this work is, has been given the title of Letter for a Time of Peace. Um, this is also a former member of the Lebanese resistance who served in the east of Saida with another communist um, group. Um, they were... Uh, they were living or they were stationed in a house that belonged to a Christian family that was displaced because that village became the front between the Israeli-occupied area of, in South Lebanon and the, the non-occupied area, which made uh, this border be kept by several um, resistance fighters or several groups of resistance fighters who led who kind of guarded the, um, the border, but also led military operations against the Israelis on the facing hills. And in 1991, when the Ta'if Accords were reached, uh, all the militias in Lebanon had to submit their arms to the Lebanese army. And this particular group was kind of not sure if the war was really over, and they did not... Uh, know if anyone will come later and destroy the houses that they were supposed to um, keep for the for the families and the owners of those houses. So he decided to write a letter addressed to the family that he did not know and bury it in in the garden of their house. And when I met him in 2002, his name is Ali Hashishu, he was a press photographer in 2002, he told me about uh, this story and I decided to, almost like in a performative work, to, do, to go and look for uh, the letter and try to, ne to negotiate between the family and all the different security uh, agencies active in, in the region in a way to uh, excavate it. So it's become very much symbolic or and, and emblematic of my work and my interest in archaeology and trying to unearth documents and try to collect them and make them uh, 
visited. And it, as much as I like what I did here, because I think it's a, hum, it's a great human story, as much as I feel sometimes that as, uh, by revealing something, I have the obligation of sending something to the future as well. So this is why, this is also why I did Letter to Sami, because it's a letter that is addressed to a future time. I'm going to show you quickly how in this house was made. This is the final uh, moment in, um, in the digging. The digging took, uh, looking for the letter, the digging took uh, two hours and a half that I recorded entirely, except like five or ten minutes at the end when, when you see the, this guy uh, who decided to look for it was a, was a military intelligence uh, guy and he decided to look himself for, for the letter by expanding the, the ditch that was being uh, uh, that was being uh, yeah. and all of a sudden we decided to uh, we, we realized that he, we found it and that we find the object so that's really the last five minutes of the recording so what very often when with works that are performative while revealing reveal, like looking for a letter you realize that actually you are in a situation where the document is not the only important thing to, to find but it triggers the, the look, looking for the document triggers something around it that belongs to the present so it has nothing to do with the intentions of those who wrote that letter, but it's, it has to do with um, the current landscape, the current situation, simply our present with all what it means. Yeah. And you can see it later in, in the film. That's, I like that moment. When, so what I did after after excavating the letter, I simply read it in front of uh, in front of everyone, and in a way I helped. Uh, I speeded the or I triggered the delivery of of the letter. That's what exactly uh, was achieved in this performance. This is how the letter looks. It says, we are the Democratic Popular Party in Lebanon, a communist party that believes in the eventual triumph of the poor and the abolition of man's exploitation of man, written in June 30, 1991, excavated in November 2002. And he ex continues to explain the war was imposed on us and we were in the position to protect, to protect our land from the Israeli plans in Lebanon. We used to be and still are against forced displacement, against demolition and against violating people's dignities. And he welcomes uh, the family to, to their property. So the family got this letter 12 years, almost 11 or 12 years later in this object. I'm going to go very quickly through this because from there on I was, I realized that I'm definitely, I have something with time capsules and I've definitely something, uh, I'm interested in producing work with time as a primary, uh, and, and, and uh, with time as an active, um, tool, uh, an active medium. And one of the situations that I was highly interested in um, from the 90s uh, has to do with the National Museum of Beirut. It's, it's an archaeological museum that was um, occupied by all sorts of armies and militias who came uh, through Beirut in the, from the, from the mid-70s until uh, 1990. And uh, there's, a, there's some, something exceptional that happened in 1977, I think, or 1978 when the director of that museum decided to gather all the collections and pour concrete on top of them. So they kind of, he decided to seal uh, the museum collections on the premises of the museum. 
and they circulated a rumor that the museum collection was, has been uh, evacuated. And all the armies that occupied the museum used these as bunkers, used, like, was hiding behind these concrete blocks, thinking that they were built by former, by, by other armies or by other militias, which, which I think is really fascinating. So I thought this is really like, almost like a time capsule also, sent from time of war to a time of, um, of peace. And that's, in, that inspired my time capsule for Documenta. Uh, for Documenta uh, 2012, I made uh, this structure that looks like an unfinished foundation. And, uh, and this is like a scenario for, um, like it's a script for the Arab Image Foundation, for kind of immuning the Arab Image Foundation uh, collection. And actually, it looks like an unfinished foundation in the park, in a Karslawa park in, uh, in Kassel. And a year later started this also fascinating story of the refusing pilot. In 1982, a few months after the Israeli invasion of Saida and South Lebanon, so probably in, in August, um, an uncle of mine came to visit um, our family in told us uh, this story that was not clear if it was a rumor or, or if it was a real story, saying that there is um, an Israeli pilot who refused to bomb the school that my father had founded and headed in Saida for, um, for more than 15 years. And he was uh, tying this to the fact that this pilot might have been from a Jewish family from Saida and might have gone to that school in his uh, youth. And then the moment he realized that he was given orders to bomb that school, he could not do it, so he bombed uh, the sea. And it's a story that stayed with me until a, a few years ago when, uh, after, when, when I published that story actually in a transcript, in a book called Let, um, a Conversation with an Israeli with an imagined Israeli filmmaker called Avi Mograbi, where, where I talk about the idea of the enemy being a documentary filmmaker and how you cope with this and what it means to belong to a, to a national entity and how trying to unmake uh, the power of national entities on you as an, as, as an individual. And I was interested in this idea of refusal, so I told this story. And a few years, a few months later, I was contacted by somebody who uh, told me that actually he had interviewed this pilot and he knows him. And so I was very interested in pursuing a project across the border, across the Lebanese Israeli border, um, trying to do something with, with it simply. It's trying to do something with it, but also highlight, highlighting the power of the individual facing a war machine. So um, that's me as a child. That's me in 1967, when I was one year old, in a picture taken in the garden of the school that my father was running back then. It's a public school for boys. Uh, it's a secondary school. So we, we used to go for weekends because it had a beautiful garden. We used to take our food and enjoy the time there, bicycles, etc. So this is 1967, this is 1970, also me in that, uh, in that garden. I'm, most of our birthday parties, for example, were done in the afternoons there. And, and of course, other, other teachers as well would bring their kids and families um, in the afternoon. That's me at, at the later stage in 19, I think 1978 or, or, or 1979. And I particularly like this picture not for my look, but for the, for the sculpture that is behind me, which had uh, really my, marked my childhood. It's a sculpture by a famous Lebanese uh, sculptor uh, called Alfred Basbous. And it's a sculpture that was given as a gift from the Ministry of Education to the school when, because uh, the first on the National Baccalaureate uh, was from that public school. So the ministry decided to, to really give, uh, to give this gift to the, 
to the school, and I spent most of my childhood playing with this uh, sculpture. The sculpture. And in nineteen uh, ninety, uh, sorry, in nineteen eighty-two, eventually the school was bombed by uh, by the, the Israeli army, and it was to a large degree destroyed. But also that coincided with my father not being anymore, uh, um, not heading the school anymore. So. I remember very well that he took me to take pictures of that school in 1982. You will see that later in, in, in the film. This is a picture of the school, and that's the garden, but coming from a different time, from a different perspective. This is a picture taken by Hashem El Madani, a photographer from Saida, on the collection of whom I worked a lot in the past 11, 12 years. And I found a lot of pictures of the Tamir area, which is the neighborhood around that school and of the school taken in the 50s. This is the school where I went, Collège de Frères Maristes. Uh, it's a, it, it's uh, in a different part of, uh, of town, on a hill. That school is near Ain al-Halwi, Palestinian camp, so it's really a highly dense area. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip quickly. June 6, 1982 is the title of a piece that I did that is based on my first photographs of the, taken on the first day of the Israeli invasion of South Lebanon. And on the same day, I took also, I wrote uh, in my diaries. And I used to write daily what's happening on a military level. But sometimes whenever I took photographs, I, I used to tag that day with photos. And whenever I watched films, I used to say which films I watched. And I kept my photographs in of June 6, 1982 with this album. And these different photos were taken in the same moment, within a few minutes, when an air raid happened in front of our house in, uh, in 1982, on the first day, in June 6. And I made this piece that circulated a lot, many of you might, might have seen it, by stitching pictures together and reconstructing the air raid based on those six pictures. And I, that was produced in, nine, in 2002. Some of you who watched yesterday's film, this day, I made them while making this day and I used them in the film. So I decided to take this, uh, these pictures as a, as a foundation on which to reconstruct a, a, another work addressed to the Israeli pilot and invite him to come watch it in Venice. So it was a work where I put all my pictures as a child, but also the pictures I have taken in the first day of the Israeli invasion from the balcony of my parents' house. I was, I'm sure I have seen him flying over Saida because I used to chase airplanes and trying to look at them and take pictures of them. Um, and I, I said, okay, I need to do something with this. And this is the Venice installation. You see uh, on the small screen the film that I just shown you, and there's one seat, one film th seat, one like a movie theater chair. Dedicated, it's part of the installation. It's dedicated for the pilot. And behind uh, that chair, the film was running. The letter to the accusing pilot. And in October 2013, I invited the pilot to 
to come in order to complete the the installation and 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 I thought that's really um, important for the completion of the work because as I said the work is like a kind of performance across a sealed border it's about communication between me and him, but without really communicating because we have a lot of barriers between us. So the only way I could do is like to create a platform on which we could build in the future. Exactly like the unfinished uh, foundation that I made for, for Kassel. It's kind of freezing a situation in time, but also make it carry something constructive in the future. I will stop here and I will, 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 will screen letter to refusing pilot and we'll do a question and answers at the end. Thank you for um, the presentation. I'm, I'm very happy to have seen this and seen some of you were uh, at the show and last night. And uh, as a sculptor, I'm, I'm drawn to your emphasis on materiality of objects. So the photographs, the capsules, the, uh, the recording apparatus. And I keep going back to the sculpture that uh, is in the school garden. And I'm wondering, especially as your practice seems to consider the, the image, how you see sculpture and the encounter, the physical encounter, Influencing the practice. I kind of prefer the term object over sculpture because sculpture carries uh, a tradition behind it, and it's really hard to liberate oneself from from the tradition of the beaux arts, like the fine arts. Um, and I'm really interested in regular objects that might not interest anyone, and I think any object can be great if it if its story is told and any object can or some object can, can have the power of communicating uh, such a complexity that this course cannot. Um, it's true I come from the background of studying images but I think looking at objects helped me look at photographs as images but also help me maybe overcome my resistance to sculpture, my natural resistance to, to, to sculpture. And I think of time capsule is a kind of a sculpture performance. Uh, I mean, there is a sculpture aspect that is more and more visible in my work. I will never call myself a sculptor, but I'm, I have a sensitivity to, uh, to objects. And, yeah, if you want to call this an interest in sculpture, it's possible. Thanks. I'm interested in your uh, sense of history, which obviously um, is really fundamental, I think, in, in some ways to your practice. Um, even right from the very beginning, you were describing um, the bombings. This was in 82. You were uh, chasing planes and, and, and documenting the air raids at that time. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So th this is at, at that time. Do you recall your your fascination? Was it? Um, did you have that sense of history in the moment at the time? Or I, I'm just wondering. It seems like it's an impulse that it keeps flowing through your work. I, I don't think back then it was an interest in writing or in history. Yeah. I think with photography particularly, I was I happened to be learning photography. Like at 16, you learn all sorts of tricks, like from putting the reel on, on a, a music player, on an open reel play, player, or trying to learn how to use a camera. And it's also the, the age where your parents start allowing you to touch things that normally they, you are not allowed to touch as a, at, a, at an earlier age. So, it's a, so I associate those mechanisms with growing up with a certain, like crossing certain threshold. And I just happened that while learning photography, what I captured was the Israeli invasion uh, in, in front of our house. And yeah, that's accidental. And I, I only became conscious 
that this material is about writing, it's way later when I was doing this day and when I was getting more and more interested in looking at other people uh, of my generation's archives and, and what they keep. And this is a generation that used to write a lot of notes. Uh, like me and my brothers wrote diaries all the time. I don't know where this came from, but it's, it's common in the 70s and 80s to do that. I have a, a supplementary question. Um, can you tell us what's in the time capsule in Carlsruhe Park? Ah, uh, I just finished a book. It's out with, it's out at Moose Publishing, where I publish all the drawings and the objects. Um, they are paintings, actually. Paintings? Yes, they are my first paintings that I decided not to, not to keep for. Or like to keep uh, in such a way because the moment you there's something photographic in them is not only they circulate only as photographs of paintings in the book but the moment you pour concrete onto them you give them another nature and you don't know how they would react to it and you don't know if they would ever uh, come back as objects the way you created them so they are they are in, com in concrete today. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. is, is there a scheduled uh, recovery? No. 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 Well, I'm, uh, I really enjoyed it. I saw your film last night. It's an amazing film. We keep talking about how can we get a copy so we can see it more. Um, I'm teaching a course that I have done for six or seven years called Art and Activism which for me is just another, I describe it in some ways as another stage of contemporary, what we call contemporary art. And last night I was fascinated because you were showing through the work some of these things about Orientalism and anthropology and you were asked questions about you know, recovering or trying to uh, hold on to um, a disappearing rather than a lived culture. So the question I have for you, which is sort of what I s set up for my class on your behalf, probably quite wrongly, is do you think the attention to um, your work and other work that has this complex mix to it uh, that appears in museums now and galleries and biennales, uh, are you in a position to make any comment about why we're so interested in this work because we're so tired of the history of our own contemporary art that it's been played over and over again and, and you are, you're one of many people telling us new stories and um, you know, I, sh I should flatten the comment I made about we're so tired of our own work. But I mean, the fact that you are bringing new stories to us is, uh, is this, do you feel this is the way that contemporary culture always goes? I, I know you're glad to be a part of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get, what is it like from your position to suddenly be invited to show this work? Is it the same as any other artist, or is it have, does it have a particular uh, meaning to you. I think uh, we only learn by by going outside of ourselves. So I think uh, I was so influenced by people who are not from Lebanon and uh, I mean artists who belong to contemporary culture. Um, for example, my interest in objects started when I encountered the work of French uh, artist Jean Luc Moulin who is also at the same time a photographer, but also practiced sculpture intensely. Um, I think with his work, I became aware of something in me, uh, an inclination uh, that I needed to build upon. So I'm simply trying to reverse your um, your interest in something different is, um, I, I do have also an interest in something different from what surrounds me. Yeah, that's all I can say, frankly. But of course, I feel like, um, 
I do believe that there are situations, historical situations, that are unique in such a way that they produce something different. Um, maybe Beirut, my generation and Beirut has to do, like has a, at least facing a similar situation. And there's a lot more that we will know about ourselves, I think, with, with time. So maybe I will be able to answer you better in the future. Uh, so I want to I want to thank you for this great presentation, and um, I want to ask you. Uh, you know, you talked about uh, you know the, the title of the show all as well, and about it. Uh, you know that this is sort of the only attitude you can have when you're facing despair. Um, but at the same time, too, it seems to be, uh, it seems to point to something that's not being said in times of despair as well, right? So, uh, like you said, many things are censored uh, in prison, but many things are censored also by the political context of, of Lebanon um, and continue to be. And in, um, in the, the, the book that you mentioned, um, Conversation with this uh, imagined Israeli filmmaker, Avi Mugabe, uh, you talk about um, you know normalizing relations, and I I wonder if you could um, you could maybe talk about two things or even just one of them. Uh, like what is if you could give us a bit more clues to what is at stake in excavating and uh, displaying Nabe Awada, and also uh, of having a letter to a refusing Israeli pilot at the Lebanese pavilion at Venice, which is such a huge diplomatic. Um, kind of space? Yeah, uh, first, of course, I never, um, I'm, I'm not into normalizing relationships between Lebanon and Israel. I don't, I don't think, I'm not a politician and I'm not, uh, I don't think the process starts with uh, 1983 because Lebanon was forced to sign a treaty, a peace treaty with Israel when the Israelis were still occupying Lebanon. Uh, and I think it's a, uh, it's a major political pitfall like, well, or something. I don't think uh, building on Lebanon's history with Israel cannot start by normalizing relationships. Maybe this provides me with um, um, with a chance to do something in the art world and not in the world of diplomacy. Although the work that I've made is about negotiation, because like many of my works are about negotiation, like digging out uh, Ali Hashisho's letter demanded a huge amount of negotiation. Um, less with Nabi Hawala, because he was really believed in writing his story through uh, an artist's work. Um, so, Having led like many um, art uh, gestures of a performative nature, starting from the work I do with Studio Shahrazad, Hashim al Madani, uh, going through um, for example, which is like by, by saying it a gesture with, of a performative nature, I mean um, an intervention in life. For example, digging out a letter from someone's garden leaves the garden with no letter. This is really like a fact in the landscape. So it's an intervention in someone's life, an intervention in, in, in that garden, a physical intervention. Um, apart from a physical intervention, I left with them knowing something about their garden they didn't know without me. And much of my works have become like this letter to Samir is as much as this like that. And conservation with an imagined Israeli filmmaker is also about this. The question is like can is it possible for a Lebanese filmmaker to meet a, to, to meet a, an, an Israeli filmmaker and can they meet outside virtual space? Can they uh, do they have anything to share? Do they have anything in common? And I start this book by saying Israel's history is my history. Because the moment Israel announces war or wages war on Lebanon, it forces itself in my personal history. And are we able to escape it? I don't think so. 
Are we able to write Lebanon's history without going to Israel? I don't think so. And if we deny ourselves uh, this right, we will be, uh, um, or like future generations will not be forgiven. And I think there's an ethical position to be taken vis-a-vis -vis war. Uh, there's an ethical situation that is uh, to be taken vis-a-vis -vis blind resistance of occupation. One of the very, very hard questions that I, I think everyone in, in I don't, I've met so many people ask themselves, like if someone comes into your house and kills your family, would you kill them? It's really a tough question. Like, you're faced with this question since you are a child, and the moment you say, I will not kill them, is a great moment of, uh, of, of liberation, I think. So even if you, if they are even, even fighting an, occup an, an, occu an occupier, uh, like, even if you resist that, it's only that moment when you join humanity. And the act of, uh, I mean, that pilot, uh, Haggai Tamir, has, has nothing to do with Lebanon. Frankly, he doesn't even think of Lebanon. He did it for his own sake. He did not do it uh, to protect any, anyone in Lebanon. He doesn't know it in his people. Um, and it's this, uh, position that I want to celebrate. I think this would be a good time to, to wrap up. Um, I'm sorry, uh, maybe you can ask your question uh, at the reception. So I would like to invite everybody uh, back to the Anglo Southern For those of you who don't know, it's just a few minutes walk south on University. Um, and now I'd really like to extend our call thanks to Akram uh, Thank uh, for speaking with us about his practice uh, and screening Letter to a Refusing Pilot. It was uh, wonderful to see. So please join me in thanking our guests.